So what makes a leader? And are leaders born or are they made? Pulitzer Prize winning author and presidential historian Doris Kearns Goodwin has spent the past few decades writing in-depth biographies of America's leaders. And in her latest book, titled Leadership in Turbulent Times, she draws upon four past presidents, Abraham Lincoln, Theodore Roosevelt, Franklin D. Roosevelt, and Lyndon Baines Johnson, and examines what made each the right leader for his time, and what today's aspiring and established leaders can learn from them. And we are delighted to welcome a good friend from a long time ago, Doris Kearns Goodwin, here to Metrofocus. It's so nice to see you. Thank you. I'm so glad to be with you. They are so very different. These, these four characters. But when you looked at them again through the lens of leadership, did you find similarities amongst them that maybe hadn't been revealed to you before? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's true. They came from entirely different backgrounds, two of them very privileged, the Roosevelts, Lincoln and LBJ, much more difficult poverty, concern about economics. Um, they had different temperaments. They're at different times. And I think it's true that sometimes the temperament fits the time. But there was a family resemblance that I could see when I looked at them all together of humility. Um, you wouldn't think of LBJ in humility at first, but not humbleness. It's the ability to acknowledge errors and yeah, what, what's, learn what's from the, your what's mistakes. What's the difference when you say humility as opposed to humbleness? Well, because you probably for the four of them, maybe Lincoln, you might. But the other three, that's not usually the first word that's going to pop into your right. mind. And it, and, and it doesn't mean that you have a low estimate or you're meek or humble. It just means that you accept that humans have limitations and that you can learn from yourself when you make mistakes. I mean, for example, Teddy Roosevelt, when he first got into the state legislature, and you're absolutely right, you never think of him as humble. In fact, they always said he loved to be in the center of attention so much that he wanted to be the baby at the baptism and the bride <laughs> at the wedding and the corpse at the funeral, right? So he gets in the state legislature, and he realizes later that he had a swelled head. He was so glad to be there. He's blistering comments about his opposition. He's pounding his fists. He makes headlines. He's become famous. And all of a sudden, he can't get anything done. So he realizes. He said, I realized that I had to change my way, that I was, I was not allowing myself to get any compromise or collaboration. So that's the ability to learn, to grow in office. And that's what I mean by humility. We often hear folks talking about our times now as being such turbulent, turbulent times. And yet you, you almost forget, when you look at the, these four figures, talk about the, the, the turbulence that surrounded them and their ascension to the offices and what they had to deal with, especially when they first walked in. Oh, I mean, think about Lincoln coming into office. I mean, he later said that if he had known the turmoil he would face, the South was already seceding before he even got there. War was beginning to ramp up. 600,000 people would soon die. He said he, wouldn't thought, he couldn't have thought he could have lived through it. Or Teddy Roosevelt, too, coming in after the assassination of McKinley. There's a real mood of rebellion in the country because of the Industrial Revolution. And the, there's a gap between the rich and the poor. And the working class is feeling like they're not getting a fair shake, and they're not. And he comes in and has to deal with all that tension. There's bombs in the street. There's a nationwide strikes going on. And then, of course, FDR coming in at the height of the Depression. When he said he was afraid the whole house of cards might collapse before he even took the oath of office. And then LBJ's got the assassination in front of him, and the country is obsessed with looking at the killing of JFK and then the killing of, of Oswald and the feeling that he's not worthy of being the successor. And the civil rights movement has heated up, and the bill's stuck in the Senate. So each of those had really turbulent times. And it's important for us to remember that in the time we're in right now, but they were the right person for the time, and the citizens were active, which makes a big difference. There's so many great stories here, and, and so many that make you feel, as you said, that you're, you're connecting with them in some ways. I was fascinated by, when you talked about who each of their heroes were. Tell me about that. Well, it came at the end. I suddenly realized there's like this family tree that, that covers the whole history of our country because LBJ's hero was FDR. I mean, he called him his political daddy. He met him when he was running for Congress. And he did the, he was in the NYA, the National Youth Administration. And Eleanor Roosevelt had come and said it was the best program in the country. So that was his hero. And he modeled his whole early life as a young New Dealer on FDR. FDR's hero was Teddy Roosevelt. In fact, he was hoping that he would have the same trajectory as Teddy when he's a young law clerk at 28. And they're all talking about, what's going to happen to us? And he says, well, I know what I'd like. I'd like the state legislature, you know. And then I'd like to eventually go to the assistant secretary of the Navy. And then I'd love to become governor. And then, who knows, maybe the presidency. 
polio cut that in a different way, which he didn't know at the time. But then anyway, so Teddy Roosevelt's hero is Abraham Lincoln. In one of the summers in 1902, when he was facing this huge coal strike, he read all nine volumes of Nicolay and Hay. And he would come out and talk to people and say, he got through this, there was a you know, right and a left, and he's in the middle, and I can do the same thing. And he learned from him over and over again. And then his hero was, um, Abraham Lincoln's hero was George Washington. So it's amazing to just think you go from, you know, LBJ to FDR, mm -hmm. from FDR to Teddy Roosevelt, from Teddy to Abraham Lincoln, from Abraham Lincoln to George Washington. It's the history of our country. Yeah, the thread running through yeah. the fabric of all of their lives. When you look at the, the four of them, they're, they're such very different men. Even you look at the Roosevelt's, same extended family, same lives of privilege, but still so terribly different. Did you find a, a single sort of consistent strand of, uh, or a trait, a leadership trait that, that identified each of them? I think I'd have to choose that the most important one was empathy. And it's either born in you, which it was I think for Lincoln, and maybe for LBJ which means that you understand other people's points of view, that you can have a feeling about other people's ways of life. I mean, Lincoln felt that as a young kid. He would watch his friends putting hot coals on turtles and knowing that it was producing pain, and he would go after them for doing that. And um, in LBJ, too, when he was a young person and he taught at the school, Katula, and he saw the pain of prejudice on these kids' faces, and he felt it emotionally. He did everything he could to make their lives better that year he was teaching. Whereas for both Roosevelt's, they had to develop empathy. They led such a privileged background for other people through politics. That's when politics can be the most broadening thing. For Teddy, he said, under, understandably, he said, when I went into politics the first time, it wasn't to make people's lives better. I just liked the adventure of it. But then he saw decrepit tenements. He saw cigar factories. He saw children working. And he began to say, I want to change their lives. And I think for FDR, polio produced even much deeper empathy than some of the natural one he must have had. He suddenly identified with other people to whom fate had an un unkind hand. So I think if that's a quality that's missing in a leader, then how do you get to other parts of the country where people feel differently than you? How do you help people that are different from your region or your class or your race? Um, and then the ability to communicate that empathy. Um, in the technology of your time and be able to persuade people to mobilize them to action would be the other side of that empathy, I think. When you look at the, the turmoil that we're experiencing today, and I'm not talking about just politically, I'm talking about both sides of the aisle, societally, culturally, which of the four that, that you chronicle here, which of the four do you think would be best suited to be a leader today? I think it would be Teddy Roosevelt. I mean, the reason being that his time was similar to ours. I mean, he always warned that the rock of democracy would founder if people in different regions or races or religions began to think of themselves as the other. And it's that division in our country today that I think underlays much of the political turmoil. It's the, the larger division that's there. And he knew how to speak to people in different parts of the country. He also would be great tweeting, I think. He had those mm -hmm. short phrases that he could do, speak right. softly and carry yeah, a big Could you stick. imagine Teddy Roosevelt <laughs> tweeting? <laughs> Absolutely. But he would think, I think, before he tweeted. Uh, yes. But don't hit until you have to, and then hit hard. He even gave Maxwell House the slogan, good to the very last drop. Did he? I, that's right. Yeah. That's right. But I think, Teddy most importantly, what he argued for was a square deal. So he was arguing, so there's people on the left, there's people on the right, and he's saying, I want a deal for the capitalists and the wage worker. I want a deal for the rich and the poor. If you're a rich person, that's fine, as long as you deal fairly. If you're a union guy, I'll be for you, unless you deal unfairly. So that, I mean, he think he would stand right in the center, but progressively moving the country forward. And he had a sense of humor. He had a self-deprecating sense of humor. My favorite story is when that famous journalist wrote a review of his Spanish-American war memoir. And he said he had so placed himself in the center of every action of the war, he should have called it alone in Cuba. <laughs> and so what does he do? He writes a letter to the journalist and saying, I regret to inform you that my wife and my intimate friends absolutely love your review of my book. Now you owe me something. I want to see you. I want to meet you. And they become friends. He was able to be friends with journalists, knowing they would still criticize him. He could criticize them. And the partnership he, he joined with the investigative reporters the muckrakers who become the golden age of journalism. So I think he had the energy. He understood, I mean, in today's world, you have to be somewhat the center of attention, at least at the moment, given the media world. And he could definitely be. He was the most colorful president we'd had up till that time. Last question for you. In 
in, in trying to learn the lessons of history, and, and we're so often told things such as that if, you know, if we don't learn history's lessons, we're, we're bound to repeat them. Um, the notion of, of the past, what Faulkner said, the past isn't even past. Do you get a sense that, that our leaders of today, and I'm talking about across the board here, that our leaders of today don't grasp that, don't grasp the need to learn from, from these men and their turmoil and their leadership skills. Don't, don't grasp the need to learn so that they can lead better. Yeah, I mean, I worry that that's, that's not happening. Even forgetting only our leaders, I mean, history courses are being narrowed in a lot of our colleges now because of STEM stuff. And what you get from history, it's as a human being, not simply as a leader, is you see how other people dealt with troubles and how they came through adversities and what were their strengths and what were their weaknesses. And I'd like to think that studying leadership helps you in your everyday lives. And, and you just need to take the time to go back a few decades. And it's like you learn from your parents, your grandparents, so learn from Abraham Lincoln, learn from George Washington. These people knew something about the strengths of leadership and some of the techniques you can actually follow. When I think about Lincoln's writing a hot letter when he was mad at somebody and then putting it aside till he cooled down psychologically, never sending it, how helpful that would be to kids writing emails too quickly sure. today, right? Absolutely. So, and, and it, Broader than that, you understand their emotional intelligence when they're dealing with a team, how they're able to share credit and shoulder blame. These are human qualities that many of them magnified by becoming leaders and how you grow through your mistakes. Um, I just got to believe that everybody should love history because it really yeah. can teach you. It teaches you about human nature. And one of the things Teddy Roosevelt said are, if you want to be a leader, you have to read books because books are about human nature. You read it in poetry, you read it in prose, you read it in drama, and you're going to learn about human nature. And that's what leaders need to know more than anything. Well, no matter what you want to be, you have to read this book here because <laughs> it's, as always, just a, 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 you take us on a fabulous and very personal journey into their backgrounds and the stories. And you come away, as you said, you come away when you close the book saying, I'm saying goodbye to some friends and I'm not that comfortable with that. But it's, it's you and I could talk for hours about this. Uh, it's always so nice to connect I'm with you. So and glad spend to be some here. time talking with you. And again, just, just another fabulous work by you. Doris, so good to see you. Thank you, you thank well. you.